this division of red numbers are red, and in this division, we are going to the magazine of the wrestler from October 1991. This is the 25-year silver anniversary celebration of wrestling's most respected magazine. And the interview is with Bruno San Martino. A Q&A with Bruno San Martino. So here we go. Each month, the wrestler will present a question and answer form with an important figure in the wrestling world. It is your chance to meet wrestling's biggest stars as they answer the questions uppermost in the fans' minds. So here we go. Bruno, it's, it's great to talk to you again. What's your reaction to, to being named the, the greatest wrestler of wrestling wrestler years? I can't tell you how flattered I am, Bill, to be ranked with Dory Funk Jr., Vern Gagne, and the others is really quite an honor. 1963 was the year that turned your life around. You beat Buddy Rogers for the WWF title. Since our magazine began publishing in 1966, I'd like to ask you who your toughest opponents were during that time period. There were so many. I had some classic battles with the Gorilla Monsoon. I recall a grueling match I had against him that lasted an hour and 25 minutes in the old Madison Square Garden. He broke one of his ribs early on in that match, but like a valiant warrior, he kept on going. Monsoon pushed me to the limits in that match. He was a big man, 401 pounds, as I recall, and he wanted my title with a passion. push you to the limit back then? Well, to name a few, Killer Kowalski, Bulldog Brower, Bill Miller, and Cowboy Bill Watts. Great competitors, all of them. But none of them could take your title. It, it took Ivan Koloff, a man you had beaten in the past, to end your first title reign. I'll never forget that night. When Koloff came off, came off the ropes with that knee drop and pinned me, he not only silenced me, but he silenced the 21,000 fans in Madison Square Garden as well. The arena was like a funeral parlor. Everyone just sat there and stared. I was no longer champion. How did, how did that feel? Horrible. But I was never one for excuses. I thought that I had let all my fans down. All I can say is that on January 18, 1971, Ivan Koloff was the better man. Truthfully, I didn't realize until the next day that it was actually a relief to lose the title. Why did you feel that way? I had held that belt since May 17, 1963, almost eight years. My body was aching and needed time to heal. Also, my wife and my sons were not getting much attention from me. That was a situation I wanted to correct. You wrestled periodically after that. And, and at one, one point, you publicly stated that you never wanted to be WWF champion again. However, you wrestled Pedro Morales for the belt in 1972 at Shia Stadium in New York. That was a situation that came about after Pedro and I had gotten into an argument during a tag team match and our friendship was in question. On top of that, the public was putting a lot of pressure on both of us. How so? Folks were saying that Pedro could not beat me, so he made the challenge. At the same time, I heard some fans saying that Bruno didn't have what it takes anymore. So we wrestled for one hour and 16 minutes until the 11 p.m. curfew. It was a classic scientific match, and we hugged afterward. We resolved our differences and became good friends again. But after that match, you said you still weren't interested in the title. So why did you accept a title match against Stan St Stasiak? in 1973. Actually, I had gone to Japan and I signed to wrestle Stasiak at the next card at Madison Square Garden before I left. While in Japan, Stasiak beat Pedro, so my match became a title match. Were you happy when you won the belt the second time? Yes. But you do not want to know a secret. I wasn't nearly as elated as the first time. When I looked at that belt as a referee handed it to me, I saw the long road ahead that was already taking the sheen off the belt for me. Did, did the second title reign prove, prove as tough as the first? Tougher. The men of the 70s seemed even more rugged. I faced Stan Hansen, Bruiser Brody, John Leo Jonathan, Bobby Duncan, and superstar Billy Graham. They were incredible. 
second ground you ended your second reign. Yes, but he pinned me with his feet on the ropes, mind you. But that was the end for Bruno in the title. At that point, I tried to get my body and personal life back together again. Any regrets about the title years? Really? There's only one. I always wanted to wrestle the NWA or AWA champions and unify the belts. So there would have been only one world champion. Other than then, then how can there be regrets? I believe I was a respected champion and a good role model. I was part of an era in wrestling that I don't think we'll ever see again. That's very sad. What has changed? Wrestlers of today are a different breed. They mostly rely on sheer power to compete. Most of the wrestlers of my era were much more versatile than today's wrestling. I could adapt to any style my opponents brought to the ring. If he was an aerial grappler, I adapted to him. If he was a powerhouse, I could change my style. Most wrestlers today can't do that. They are not schooled the way my generation of wrestler was. How would Bruno, Bruno San Martino in his prime fare against current WWF world champion Hulk Hogan? Don't make me laugh. My feeling is that Hogan is more show than he is a wrestler. I really don't think I would have much trouble beating Hogan. Let's just leave it at that. What about Ric Flair? Flair could have given me some trouble. He's very smart, and he can be a fine technical wrestler when he wants to be. Flair is one of the few stars today I can honestly call a wrestler. Who are some of the others? Rick Steamboat is a fine wrestler. Larry Zabisco, well, yeah. Larry, despite all that he's gone on between us, is one of the all-time best. I'd also add Bret Hart to that list. His father, Stu Hart truly brought the greatness out in that kid. I'm also impressed with Steve Williams and the Steiner brothers. What about your son, David San Martino? No, I won't forget about him. <laughs> David is in his prime now. He is sleek, his body looks great, and performs well for him. If David can work his way into a major federation, I predict big things for him. You seem, you seem dissatisfied, dissatisfied with, with sport today. Where do you where do you think wrestling is headed? I wish it were headed backyard, backward. I really don't like the way wrestling is today. There's too much show today. Every wrestler has a gimmick. You know what I mean? In my day, you didn't come to the ring with a snake or a bird or have to be surrounded by celebrities. Sure, some guys wore masks. We had cage matches. But in my day, wrestling was more pure. People came to see what the marquee adver advertised, wrestling. I am actually embarrassed by some of the ridiculous things I see today. You've been quite vocal in airing your gripes in recent years. Well, why not? People come up to me and ask me about some of this garbage today, and I don't know what to say to them. I worked very hard in my years to put some respectability in wrestling. Many of the promoters today have gone out of their way to erase any trace of that. I can just hope and pray that someday the public will tire of all this glitz and demand that the promoters bring back to good wrestling. Get rid of all the showmanship that some people think is necessary to draw crowds. In, in your estimation, what does draw crowds? Wrestling. Quality wrestling. I had 211 main events at Madison Square Garden, the two gardens, and I had 187 sellouts in all. Nobody has done that since. Wrestling just isn't the same anymore. Amen. Well, there we go, guys. That's this week's edition of Bedtime Stories with Brad and Braden from The Wrestler, October 1991. There's the magazine cover. You can check us out on our YouTube channels, Brad's Collection and Braden's Toy Show. We will see you next time. Bye. Bye, guys.